Upstairs at Freelix, show 101, real one. No, you. I go both ways. So, uh, what, what is the Student Bodies from 1981? Directed by Mickey Rose and uncredited directing and writing by Michael Ritchie. Yeah, I, now, Mickey Rose, I know nothing about. He must have been a like a just somebody who had this idea to do uh, a movie that was essentially a parody of slasher films. Um, now this, the, this is what I remember about the movie is it's not that great. It's, uh, it's, it, it, there is, uh, there's a lot of like, uh, service for people who might be interested in slasher films and it kind of gives you an educational course into how to make a slasher film in that way. Right. Well, this movie does, I mean, this was scream before scream came out. Yeah, I mean, that's that, the, that, that, that's the best way to describe that's it. That's what I was thinking. But, you know, the thing about Scream was that it was a kind of a postmodern horror movie that was, you know, it was kind of like, you know, they didn't really use the word back then, but it was it was what you would call meta now. It was it was aware of itself. And it was right. Yeah. Both movies, both movies do deconstruct the slasher film. But this one is kind of goofy because it's 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 written by. Um, uh, well, I mean, it's we well, it a... is written. It's written by Mickey Rose, but it is uncredited rewrites by Michael Ritchie. Yeah, they brought Michael Ritchie in because I guess they didn't think that this this uh, Mickey Rose could pull it off. Michael Ritchie, of course, the director of the Bad News Bears and uh, Fletch, 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 of course, a classic. Uh, he's he's very much a kind of hit or miss director, but when he makes a hit, it is really good. Oh yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, and and now I, I was thinking about the similar horror comedies that were coming out at that time, and I thought of Saturday the Fourteenth with Richard Benjamin and Haunted uh, Honeymoon with Gene Wilder, and then of course there was Young Frankenstein, which came before it, but and then there was Ghostbusters, which came after it. But those those were different kind of comedy here. This was this was just parody because you got a you remember Airplane came out in 1980. Right. So as soon as Airplane hit really big, somebody wanted to capitalize on that. Like somebody out there just wanted to do, hey, let's do a parody horror movie. You know, that's be the first to market to do it. Yeah. It, and yeah, it, that's it, pretty it, much what Student Bodies was. I mean, it was just I yeah. mean, yes, by today's standards, it's not that funny. I'll even admit that it's not that funny. But you know what? <laughs> I enjoy it. It would definitely it would have it, it would have that kind of appeal if you're expecting it to be as funny as their airplane is like one of those movies that is absolutely ridiculously funny. Has you laughing your ass off. There's so many things in there that they that they throw in. You don't even realize until you've seen it a hundred times. Um I'll give you an example of a joke from Airplane that I didn't catch until recently. Uh, the doctor from the Mayo Clinic who has to, <laughs> he, they have to get this girl. they got the sick girl on board. She's got to be shuttled to this Mayo Clinic for an operation that will save her life. He sits down at his desk. He's talking on the phone, and there's a whole cabinet full of mayonnaise behind him. Really? Because it's called the Mayo Clinic. There's a whole cabinet behind him of Hellman's mayonnaise. And you don't. You see, you, see, you, that's, you that's notice a gag you don't pick up on until unless you're looking, right? Right. And I didn't even notice that gag until you just said something. See, that's that's the kind of movie that you want to watch. So many gags flying at you minute by minute that you can't pick up on any of them. You have to watch it seven, eight, nine times to catch every joke. That's that. There's so much there to distract you. Like the the whole joke of the guy at the Mayo Clinic is we have the heart and it's ready for transplant, and the heart is seen bouncing on the desk. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's like I mean a lot of thought put into that. But what it was, I mean, they took they they looked at a movie. I think the the Zucker brothers and Jim Abrahams they looked at a movie uh i forgot the name of the movie but it was a i think it was a paramount title i can't remember the name of it but what i do know is that they had to buy the rights to it because they pretty much copied more than 50 percent they of it. But yeah they took the movie and they just added their gags to it you know and it exactly. was it was around the time that they were actually working on the kentucky fried movie that they had this thing on a videotape or something. They were like, they, because part of their research for Kentucky Fried Movie when they were writing it was looking at late night stuff with commercials and all that stuff. And then they happened to, ha oh, Zero Hour, I think is the name of the movie. That's it, Zero Hour. That's it. Uh, and that movie happened to be on their videotape and they were looking at it and it was all straight. It was all drama. And they were like, what if we made this a comedy? But 
with student bodies, okay, the problem, okay, the problem with student bodies is it comes out in 1981, which isn't even the peak of slasher films. And and that you are absolutely, I was just going to say that it's like, if you're going to parody something, you need at least seven, eight, or nine horror movies to get funneled down the line. Yeah, this yeah. movie is literally just parodying Friday the Thirteenth and Halloween. Yeah, it's like uh, Halloween comes out in '78. That might have been the unofficial start of the slasher film. That's 1978. Friday the Thirteenth comes out '79. Um, and you've only got like a couple other movies that were slasher films at the time that that made big box office before 1981. The slasher film would like continue in popularity until probably what the mid 80s, late 80s, something like that. Late 80s. I mean, uh, postscript to what you were talking about with the slasher films, there were two slashers that did predate Halloween and Friday the 13th. Um, the first one, although not as popular, Twitch of the Death Nerve, a.k.a. Bay of Blood, okay. Mario Bava, 1971. Right, yeah. And then you also have Bob Clark's Black Christmas. Black, Black Christmas. Christmas. And, but also, you could call Psycho a slasher film, too. You you could, but it's more of a thriller and psychological horror more than a slasher. I mean, it gets it gets pigeonholed into that genre, but I don't I don't consider Psycho a slasher. I would I, I would I would put it there because I know a lot of these filmmakers looked at Psycho and they said let's 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 go next level with this with this idea. It's like let, yeah, let's take that shower scene and make a whole entire movie out of it. Yeah, it's it's like that because you don't know a lot. You know, most of the time you don't know who the killer is in, in most of these movies, right? And then it's revealed at the end. Oh yeah, one more we forgot about Prom Night. That did come out uh, before Prom Night, Student also Bodies Jamie Lee Curtis, right? Yep, Jamie Lee Curtis. Who I just saw, actually, it's funny, because um, I picked up the the Blu-ray uh, set of Buck Rogers, and she's in an episode that I totally remember watching when I was a kid. And you this, see, you're lucky. You got that on Blu-ray. I have that on DVD. I got it's a, It's a very nice Blu-ray. Uh, they, they imported it from Australia. And uh, it's beautiful. It looks great. I, I, we wanted to watch it again because we were watching it on MeTV. They were showing reruns on MeTV. And MeTV is kind of, it's, it's not a great channel because it's not always consistent. Sometimes there are real video problems with, with the broadcast. And uh, it really kind of disappointed us a lot of times. So we would go and, so I picked up the Buck Rogers set. I mean, with a show like that with Buck Rogers, I know we're getting way off tangent, so mm. we'll get back onto it. A show like Buck Rogers, I never was exposed to it, so when I found the DVD set at my thrift store for a buck, I was all over it. Oh man, but, you know you get uh, yeah, the greatest I, deals. I don't understand it. You get you get all of these movies in thrift stores over in your neck of the woods. I can't find a damn thing around here. So come out to Chicago, <laughs> man. It's like I told you, to- if you if you want like a twenty year old curling iron, then they've got they got them, but they've got nothing here. Hey, but you know what? To make you feel better, okay, I spent like 50 bucks on the Complete Galactica on Blu-ray, okay? On not, Blu-ray. Not, the new, not the new Galactica, the original Galactica. Uh, not, to get so, off, not to get off on a little tangent here, but why, um, why, do people, why, why do these people buy this stuff and then they either sell it back to a thrift store or they put it up on eBay like right after? Two reasons. A, streaming. Okay. B, somebody died. Okay. Oh. I mean, that's 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 brutal freaking honesty. Either they evolved to streaming and they don't want to collect physical media anymore, or they died and their family donated it to the thrift store as a write-off. See, it drives my wife crazy because I buy this stuff, and she's like, we don't have any space for this. Why do you keep buying all this stuff? That's not actually how she talks. because. No, I think your wife <laughs> and my wife would be great friends. <laughs> it's... Because she says the same exact shit to me every day. Like, she's Why like, do where are we going to put all movies? this stuff? I'm like, because they're because you can't find half this shit on streaming, so fuck your couch. I'm buying what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I've got like over fifty Warner clamshells, and she's like, "Where are we gonna put these?" But I have them where I could see them. I like them. And then I have I have like you know uh, Rubbermaid crates down in the basement filled with videotapes and DVDs and all kinds of stuff. Plus, I you know I mean the thing about it is, and I, I got into fights with uh, over on one of the Facebook groups about this. My TV is so awesome that it makes DVDs look good too. I mean, we looked at the Johnny Dangerously. Uh, it's a little grainy, maybe a little dark, but um, it's still a wonderful image that I'm getting from the player to the television, so it looks wonderful. Um, I like your segue that you're doing right now. We're going right into Johnny Dangerously. That's awesome. Johnny Dangerously, which we just watched. 
Oh, but first, well, final comment about student bodies that I was thinking about was the uh, it. There are there are a couple of funny moments. There's this running death count. I remember yeah, that. that whenever, I love that whenever somebody dies, that you see a bing, and it reminds you of like you go to YouTube and you type in Friday the Thirteenth, the final chapter, deaths. And then there's a counter that pops up for all the kids that die in that movie or all the kids that die in any of the movies. So it's like, bing, 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 four, five, six, and it goes up like that. Oh, and there's a, there was a funny gag that I remember where a guy was sitting at a desk, and he says, we want an R rating for this movie, so fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and that was and that was funny is they needed that to get the R rating. And I feel that The Simpsons ripped that off for one of their Halloween specials where uh, they have a guy sitting at a desk saying, this this uh, this um, episode is being rated TVG, and then a knife comes out of the um, out of the yep. uh, the warning. Like, oh advisor. God! And no! He, he says Stop. he says Don't. Jiminy Crips Christmas. He says fudge, <laughs> and then dies, and it becomes TVMA. Um, <laughs> but, I, I guess I'll I'll leave on my two favorite lines from that movie. Number one, horse head bookends. Okay. <laughs> Number two, Melver P. Red. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is. So that was Student Bodies. It's uh, it was uh, it was re-released to Blu-ray by Olive Films, which also re-released uh, a movie that we're going to be talking about at some point. I believe it's what is it? Um, uh, oh, what was it? I think it was Street Smart. Oh yeah, they re-released Street oh, Smart. Oh yeah, on, Street Smart on yes. Blu-ray. And Olive Films. I don't know what that is. That must be some kind of a, like a distribution outlet. They are, they are, uh, they're kind of like Scream Shout Factory, you know, they, uh, buy the licenses up, but I'm telling you, man, some of the movies they do are trash. Mm. Well, like, uh, again, not to get too far off tangent, but you take a movie like Student Bodies, and when they do it, okay, it's fine, all right? We're not expecting a shitload of special features or the greatest transfer. Right. But you take a movie like Bound, which is just a phenomenal piece that of That is, uh, the Wachowski... Sisters, the which the Wachowski sisters, <laughs> they're sisters now. <laughs> the sisters, La- Lana and whatever the other one is, I can't remember. Laura, Lana, Lorraine, something like that. They something like that. They, they were brothers once. Yep. And uh, they, Andy and Larry, and then they became Laura and Lana. Laura and Lana, something like that. Yeah. But that's what Hollywood to, will do to you, kids. Stay away. I know it'll 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 just make you do shit you never thought you could do. I mean, <laughs> but you know what? More power to them. Either way, but uh, back to Bound, um, Olive put out their Blu-ray of Bound, and it's trash. Oh. Like, it has um, zero special features, and for all you techno nerds out there, instead of seamless branching, because there's two different cuts of uh, Bound, there's an R-rated and an unrated, the unrated meaning there is uh, more sexual scenes during the lesbian scene. Oh, okay. But, gotcha. um... Instead of making a branching version on that on the Blu-ray, they actually took the Blu-ray on a 25 gig disc and made two separate cuts oh, okay. of this movie. And I'm like, wow, OK, that's pretty bad for like a marquee title like Bound. So I just imported the Blu-ray from Europe, which is much better. So, oh, OK. Yay. All right. But, so yeah. Next. Uh, next up, we have Johnny Dangerously, which we which I watched uh, last night. This movie is not available on Blu-ray. Uh, and the. The version of it that I grabbed uh, is uh, it cost me like like three bucks. I mean, and it was an add-on title too. So I have a feeling like they have like they're finishing up the rest of their stock and they're just going to sell it off and that'll be it. Well, yeah, with the with the Disney Fox deal in place, uh, I'm believe a lot of titles are going to probably go out of print here in a couple of months, maybe within the next year. Yeah. So if uh, Johnny Dangerously is one of them titles that I'm definitely going to pick up on DVD. Very, very soon. Now, Johnny Dangerously is a favorite of mine. Ever since I was a kid, they showed it on cable. I loved it. I even remember commercials for it on television at the time when it was coming out to theaters. This was a Mike. This was a different Michael Keaton. This was Michael Keaton back when he was funny, and he was he became really famous as a result of Mr. Mom, which became a big hit as a result of him. Basically, he pretty much carried the movie because he had really great comic timing, and he was also he was also a stand-up comedian. So, I mean, like, he worked, he actually worked, uh, one of his first jobs was uh, working on Mr. Rogers. He was... Uh, I do remember that. He was part of the, uh, he was one of the puppeteers or something on Mr. Rogers, something like that. And he did stand-up comedy, and then he, he wound up 
Uh, actually, he was born Michael Douglas, changed his name to Michael Keaton. And uh, he did Mr. Mom, and he became famous as a result. Well, he did. Well, his first movie was Night Shift, which I, I was gonna. I was just gonna say, you better say Night Shift. Yeah, right. Ron Ron Howard was the guy who kind of like brought him into the whole fray. And I have, I believe, I have the Warner clamshell of Night Shift. Maybe I can dig that out at some point too, if I can find. I it. do have the. I have the DVD of Night Shift, and I think that is a. A brilliant, brilliant Michael Keaton movie. I love that movie. Dare oh, I say, I, I, <laughs> it's like this, my friend. I am more high on something that you can imagine right now. Ah, beer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my, one see, of my favorite gags of his was the uh, the mug shot when they take his picture, <laughs> and he's like, I, I even tried to do a parody of it for a project I was working on, where I wanted to, I wanted this actress to do exactly what he did during this mug shot photograph. I thought. Um, but yeah, that was Night Shift, directed by Ron Howard, uh, starring Henry Winkler, Michael Keaton, Shelley Long, uh, and a gaggle of other people. But uh, and then after that, he did Mr. Mom, of course, and he did Johnny Dangerously, which is a, a parody of gangster films. And it's a, it, you know, my wife was watching it; she giggled maybe twice throughout the movie and was just watching me laugh the whole time. Um, the two things that she laughed at were uh, the jokes with his mother. Uh, played by <laughs> Maureen Stapleton because uh, she says she says something like I go both ways and that made that made my wife laugh. I um, love that joke. <laughs> but it's like it's 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 kind of it's it's directed by Amy Heckerling. It's it's a weird project for her because she doesn't really do stuff like that. So this was like a weird early project. I guess it was a big studio thing that she got at the time after she did Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And then she would go on to do movies like Look Who's Talking, which which I thought was funny, but it's it's not anywhere near the classic that Johnny Dangerously is. Oh, yeah. I mean, Look Who's Talking does not hold up. It's a but, talking uh, baby with the voice of yeah, Bruce But Willis. it's a good movie, though. It's a good movie. It's, I'm just saying it doesn't it doesn't hold up. Like, I don't I, don't I had a girlfriend who was a big fan it. of that. And she showed it to me. And then she took me to see the sequel, which had just come out. Look Who's Talking to. So I was, <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's cute. OK, it's cute. It's cute. And that was it. <laughs> That's all it did for me. And then after that, she did Clueless, which I, I'm not really a big fan of. But neither neither am I. Don't worry about that. Neither am I. Yeah. it's just. But, you know, I mean, like a very talented actual director there and, and goes and directs this gangster parody, which is like it's written by four old hat Hollywood uh, TV screenwriter, TV tele, teleplay writers, comedy. Um, and it's done kind of in the style of, I would say. It's 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 less uh, Zucker Brothers and more Mel Brooks. I was just going to say that it's like um, it's just like Blazing Saddles, only a gangster version of Blazing Saddles and not R rated, of course. Yeah. And it's well, it's different than than, say, Student Bodies, because Student Bodies tries to deconstruct the slasher film. This movie actually is a gangster movie. You know, it has all the all the elements of a gangster movie. But then you also got to remember what Mel Brooks said. He's like, take a Western and and have a 70s vibe to it. You know, they did the same thing with, with Johnny Dangerous. It's like, take a gangster movie, but have an 80s vibe. To kind it. Of because an 80, they kind of yeah. they kind of did have an 80s vibe to it. Well, yeah, yeah, because there was like this retro period in the mid 80s that was uh, we, we were kind of like going back to the 50s. You know, you had Back to the Future. You had Streets of Fire, which is kind of has that feel to it, too. You know, and and you have a movie like this, and and it was sort of like a thing, and even the fashion uh, of the time was was kind of retro in that way. Girls were wearing skirts again; they were dressing like girls. This is a back at a time when girls were dressing like girls. You remember that time, right? Oh, of course, I remember that time. <laughs> um, <laughs> but here you got a, another. Uh, this this has a big cast in it. it. It's got, of course, Michael Keaton as as Johnny Kelly, Griffin Dunn. Uh, as his uh, brother Tommy Kelly, Maurice Stapleton. Who is a, who is a great underused actor? I, I love Griffin Dunn. Ever since American Werewolf in London, yeah. you've got this, you've got After Hours. So many great oh, movies God, he did, After but they Hours, don't fantastic. use him enough. Yeah, they did. I think I think he was um, moving away from acting and getting into directing um, at some point in the '90s, right? Right, he did direct. He for... di I remember he directed a movie, a movie I actually enjoyed. I think it was called Addicted to Love with Meg Ryan and was it Matthew Broderick? Yep, Meg Ryan, Matthew Broderick. I thought it was okay, uh, but you know. But he does. I yeah, mean, he sometimes he does. Re he did return to act. Like he, um, he was in an episode of Frasier. He just popped up out of nowhere in an episode of Frasier. 
40 days and 40 nights and 40 days and 40 nights. Yeah. Um, he was the editor of, uh, or he, I think he was the editor of Josh, wherever he worked. He had the, he had the great scene with the Viagra that made me laugh my ass off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and okay. So, and then you also have, uh, Dom DeLuise in a cameo. Yep. You have Mary Lou Henner plays the girl, Lil Sheridan, Peter uh, Boyle, Peter Boyle. So you got a couple of people from Mel Brooks movies in there. Just, and I then guess, of course, maybe to Alan Hale. Alan Hale. Alan Hale, the nice skipper. Cameo. The skipper yep. is in that. Duckies and bunnies. Um, <laughs> and uh, what, uh, oh, Danny DeVito also. And they play a couple of scenes together. And I'm like trying to show Regan. I'm trying to tell her, look, it's the Batman and Penguin. And um, Oh, man. And uh, uh, well, Ray Walston as the uh, the newspaper vendor who keeps yeah, getting that hit was, with the I newspaper. I love his role. It's like, it's like I'm. It's like I can see, I can hear. <laughs> but who but am who I? Who am I? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very, very. It, 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 this is a, a fun movie. Um, I, I I don't understand why why Fox would not give it the full Blu-ray treatment unless it's because it's it, maybe it was produced by different independent production companies. Because a lot of times, if a movie isn't owned outright by the studio, if it's a like a split and in interest between two different uh, or three or four different production companies or entities or something like that, it's a little harder to get a release. But oh, yeah. I mean, I agree. I mean, I think it could have gotten the Twilight Time treatment, but I don't – I, you know, with Fox, this is before the Disney merger, of course. Yeah. They always said if the title was selling really well on DVD, they kind of never saw a reason to put it out on Blu-ray. Right. I mean, and the, and the thing is with Johnny Dangerously, it's not a top-tier title for them. But if it was selling well enough on DVD and it was moving like X amount of units per year, they just kept it on DVD because they knew if they translated it to high definition, they probably weren't going to sell right. extra copies. Oh, so, and um, okay, now when I first saw it on cable, it it began the movie began with a song by Al Franken. This is the life. Uh, oh, Weird Al Yankovic, sir. Yes, you said Al Franken. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Weird, weird out Frank It, it, it is not Stuart Smalley. Okay, it's not Stuart Smalley. It's, it's weird out. <laughs> it's time to start thinking about me. Weird Al Frankovich. Um, no. Uh, no, it's uh, it's this is the life by Weird Al, and that that was in the credits in the opening credits when it was on cable. But then the song was removed for video when it was when it was released on Fox Video, CBS Fox Video, back at the time for rights issues, which is so dumb. It's one of the things I really hate about about some releases. They have to change the music because they don't have the rights. Well, the song was restored for the DVD release, so it is available, yep. at least in that, if you can get your hands on it. Remember, it's three bucks on Amazon. I mean, that's 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 less than a cup of coffee these days. Grab the movie. It's a great movie. A lot of fun. A lot of off-color humor that you're not going to find in movies anymore. And it's just, it's like a joke a minute. It is. And then, of course, or less, the, the, the butchering of the English language, which is, <laughs> of course, the reason you go see the movie. Oh, and that's part of the menu, too. On the menu, when you when you pop in the DVD, it's like play the Fargan movie, you know, and you, you, you hit it. And it actually does. It's like a newspaper headline with all these things on it. It's a clever little menu that they put on on the disc. Anyway, a lot of fun. Uh, uh, again, Michael Keaton, when he wasn't serious, he didn't become a serious actor. And all that stuff. I, I think after Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice was probably the end of it. Was the end of his career of of making uh, movies where he's funny. Yeah, because right after Beetlejuice, then he did Batman, and then he did uh, what was the name of that? Clean and Sober. Clean and Sober. He did a movie called One Good Cop. Yeah, um, One Good Cop was a good movie, though. It was good, but it was drama. You know, I mean, he's a fine actor. He's a fine actor, but he's also funny. This is something I remembered when he made his appearance on Comic Relief. The very first comic relief in 1985 or 1986 on, on HBO, he didn't. He wasn't one of the actors who came out to talk about how people are homeless. He actually did a stand-up routine on the on the show, which I found really awesome. It was really cool that he did that. I'm definitely gonna have to check that out now. Okay, uh, I think that's all we need to say, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we covered bases of both of these movies. So, all right. Okay, in tribute to Michael Keaton, who we talked about Johnny Dangerously in this episode, I dug up my Night Shift Warner Brothers clamshell. This was made in Canada, another product of WIA, uh, Fabrique au Canada, starring Henry Winkler, uh, Michael Keaton, and Shelley Long. Uh, open it up. 
And as you can see, I've begun to understand, I believe, oh, there's a rare Warner Shield right here instead of the regular uh, Saul Bass logo. Uh, I've begun to figure out that the, that these labels were made just for the Canadian market. Now, if this were an American uh, version of the Warner clamshell, it would just have the sticker that actually fits inside that area where it's supposed to be. These are just random, you know, run-of-the-mill stickers. They just slapped them on everything in Canada. I guess they didn't have as big a budget. You can see that's number 225 there, so this was obviously a video rental title. Okay, let's see the back cover. And here we have a city morgue attendant gets an X-rated idea! But unfortunately, the movie is rated R. And there's the lovely essay there. And it goes on about Michael Keaton, actually, because he's kind of the breakout star of this movie. And uh, as, as you know, he gets all the best lines. He gets to be the funny man, whereas Henry Winkler and Shelley Long are the straight people in this, just sort of reacting to his insanity. And he has the classic line, Love Brokers! Love Brokers!